I find it difficult to stand still, but I'll try and do that. I don't have a wireless mic. Um, up to uh, 1986, uh, I, I was working on a, a project with uh, AT&T, and we put a cable across the Atlantic, and that was one of the proudest moments, to get a first fiber optic cable across the Atlantic. Uh, but more recently, um, I've had a, another claim to fame, and you won't be able to read it from where you're sitting, uh, but along the side of this cable, it says, uh, Peter Cochran, roses are red, violets are blue, but I know that this optical fiber cable will mean more to you. And, and this is my uh, present from my wife on Valentine's Day. And so uh, this, this is possibly my ultimate uh, engineering accolade. So to give you an idea of the way my mind works and what I do, in 1986, I got fiber to the home cheaper than copper. By 1990, we were rolling it out in the UK. And by 1991, the Thatcher government stopped it because they wanted the cable companies in from the US. What a good move. Our uh, Korean colleagues and Japanese colleagues carried on. And the rest, as they say, is history. So um, the, the last really big fiber to the home project we did was uh, on Jersey. Not Jersey. It was Jersey, the island of Jersey. Um, they've just gone 50% of the homes have now got one gigabit both ways. What's not apparent to a lot of people in government is that no upload speed uh, than uh, no cloud computing. Uh, it cripples a country and people. So some unusual clues here. We didn't fiber from the core out. We fibered from the periphery in. Uh, we didn't use BPON, GPON, or anything with PON on it. Uh, it's direct fiber. GPON, BPON are a manifestation of when fiber was 50 pence uh, a meter. Now it's uh, uh, a penny a meter. Who cares? You can waste it. Anyway, this uh, is an interesting island. They've got 3G. Uh, wide open and Wi-Fi wide open in uh, every home and office so you can walk in with an AT&T phone and make a phone call or a Vodafone service and you can make a phone call and Jersey Telecom uh, make a few dimes on the call. This is the view uh, from my backyard. That uh, church tower there uh, is very interesting. It was built uh, around about 1100. Um, <clears throat> largely sat there as a, a monument. Uh, it's lovely and cared for by the uh, um, community. And uh, just inside, you'll see inside the, the, the belfry shutters, there's guys installing an antenna. And uh, on the roof, firing between the battlements, uh, there's this microwave link. And we've just rolled out um, a five gig uh, wireless system because uh, the, the community got a bit fed up. And between those battlements, there's an antenna two kilometers distant, which I'll show you in a second. So here's the, the installation inside the tower. It's invisible. Uh, it gives people quite a bit of bandwidth. And that's the entire power feed and battery backup system screwed to a wall. Uh, this is the feeder tower, two kilometers distance. And I'll give you a guess who was up there in that uh, rig putting the antennas on that tower when the heavens opened and it absolutely poured it down with rain. And let me tell you, you can't get down very quickly at all. So now this community has got broadband. And really, it's just a, a bit of a problem of getting enough people together. It's not a technology problem. It's just a question of just doing it. So uh, to be honest, I got really tired of the whole topic. Uh, it holds no interest for me. I go and help people do it. But actually, telecommunications per se is one of the most boring things uh, that you can actually get engaged in. And so I, I prefer to go and do interesting stuff. And this is interesting stuff. Here is the internet today. It's absolutely wide open. Here we go. The Acme Company server. You actually find it. And then you go inside and you'll find the accounts department. You'll find the human remains department. You, you'll find the, the customer data, you'll find the design data, you'll find the order book, and of course, you'll find all the secret files in a folder called secret files. I mean, how easy is it to be from the dark side? Uh, it makes no sense. So there's absolutely no wonder in my mind 
that we've got a terrific security problem. And uh, what I want to do in the next uh, 25 minutes or so is engage with you in how we might confound the dark side of the force. And I don't think it's all that difficult. <clears throat> and here are some statements. First of all, cloud computing is inherently more secure than anything we've experienced before. It's also more resilient than anything we've seen before, more cost effective, and it empowers people and creates more creativity than anything before, period. So, you go to most companies and most conferences and people have got the counter view. So let's just have a look at this. First of all, the era of sitting at a desk in front of a personal computer, which, by the way, was never personal. It was always corporate. Socks and underwear are personal. <laughs> corporate computers are not. iPads, laptops that you own are. And so the computing power, the creativity, the connectivity, everything is moving to the edge. And this is no longer a single screen world. Young people have multiple screens. And then there's the stuff that we're going to put online. And it's now difficult to find goods that are not online. So I'll give you an idea of the impact. In the UK, in most of Europe, less than 7% of all the modern television sets are connected to the internet because there's not enough bandwidth available for people to watch TV. We have Lucky Gold Star, Samsung, Sony, and a lot of other companies gnashing their teeth because they can't launch services that they would like to give the public because there's no bandwidth. So the model isn't working. Uh, IT departments are a manifestation of uh, old thinking and old ways of doing things. And, and they just don't work anymore. And, and they're not actually engaged to help you do anything. They're there to make sure they don't get fired. They're, they're not a positive force. They're very difficult. And, and so we've all had these kinds of experiences. Now, as far as I can see, this is the growth uh, of the cloud. And right now, it's gone through about 600 million people. Uh, and mostly, uh, these are in the West, funnily enough. And it's growing exponentially. Uh, sometime next year, um, it looks like it's going to go through uh, a billion. So these are subscriptions, but it's not at all clear how many of these are people with computers and, and how many of these things are devices. It's just a series of uh, accounts and things. So um, I want to run something past you because I, I get rather confused by the views that are put forward in the press. And, and I look at it like this, that the cloud is not singular but plural. It's not a solid thing, it's vacuous. It's not fixed but mobile. Um, and it's not permanent, it's a transient entity. And this is what it can be, corporate, commercial, government, personal, global, local, people, things, open, closed, visible, and it can be invisible. Now, this is a phenomenal series of variants that we can exploit. And I, I look to very young people, and, and I mean little children, and I look at uh, adolescents, and I see what they're doing. I was called into a company a few days ago, and they got a terrible uh, malware problem, and the CIO was gnashing his teeth that he couldn't find where it was getting through the firewall. And the first thing I see as I walk into the office is a series of young people with the corporate computer and their personal computer side by side, and they were using a memory stick to transfer the information one to the other. So if, excuse me, it's not the firewall, possibly. So the, the youngsters are, are creating fast operations, and they'd, they'd rather work in a, in a new company for a lower salary than work for giant corporations that are not moving or thinking. So this is the single biggest worry the information security, uh, and, and are there any things that we can do about it? Right now, we have got the worst plague of malware and uh, security uh, problems that we've ever seen, and it's getting worse. For sure, firewalls and virus checkers are ineffective, and we've got to think a little more radically. First of all, 
get rid of all the hierarchy. The cloud does a great job of levering everything, and it's actually quite difficult to spot a really interesting target when the hierarchy is driven out and everything looks pretty much the same. Secondly, scale makes it ever so easy to be anonymous, to disappear, to hide, to hide things, to hide people, to hide information. Um, this is the UK just lighting up, and it's on a massive scale in a compact uh, region. The dark side absolutely loves monocultures, and what I mean here, one operating system, one office suite, one kind of device, has been the dark side's dream. How wonderful. So the more operating systems, the more devices, the more applications we can get out there, the more difficult we can make it for them. So they love order, and they hate discontinuities. So if we're going to disrupt the bad people, we have to think in terms of putting disruption discontinuities in there. So we hand opportunity to them on a plate because we're slow to detect, we're slow to affect, we're slow to repair and repel. We have got to get real fast at detecting that these people are attacking us and do something about it. So we have to reduce the opportunity time uh, as best we can. And uh, another thing that we can do is move. Uh, it's very hard to hit a moving target, and that's why I'm rather nervous this afternoon. I usually walk so that you, if you throw something, you can't hit me. But um, it's actually quite tricky when people are using multiple devices from multiple locations, using multiple operating systems, to actually break into their accounts and do stuff. And so this is another thing that we can do. So camouflage is an, another obvious thing. Why do we put labels on things and make them so obvious? Um, the Acme server, and there's lots of juicy secrets in here, is not very clever. So beyond that, there turns out to be a series of very interesting technologies that go under the heading of cloaking, where we can use URL hopping in the same way that we use frequency hopping in the radio domain. We can have ghosts and decoys, and we can leave honeypots around. And it's up to us to actually exploit these degrees of freedom to confound the dark side. The other thing that is interesting is the half-life of knowledge, data, information, location, connection, and all the other things. Most of the time, email is of no use to anyone. Unless you've got a priori knowledge and you're a part of a long conversation, it can be really, really difficult uh, text messages, tweets, very, very difficult to decode them if you're not part of a community and you know what the background is. Something else that we can exploit. So here we are, a kind of a cloud. It's dynamic. There are many of them. Multiple providers. Many different servers, databases. We can vary our logon routine. We can be mobile and multi-mode. And we can be multi-location. And the way we get in and out, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, whatever. Uh, let's just do a check. How many people have got multiple Wi-Fi accounts? Anybody got more than five Wi-Fi accounts? With, yeah, OK. I'm not sure what a Wi-Fi account well, is. Well, uh, let, let's see. Um, if, if I go out there uh, right now, uh, I'm staying in a hotel. Uh, because uh, I got a, a, a premium uh, card with that hotel, I get uh, free Wi-Fi. Uh, if I go to a coffee shop, uh, certainly in the UK, uh, there are about three premier coffee shops. I've got accounts with all three of them. And then, funnily enough, O2 will give you, no matter if you're a, you don't have to be a customer of O2, if you come to the UK <laughs> and you see an O2 uh, hotspot, Wi-Fi, this is a mobile operator, they will give you a free Wi-Fi account to dissuade you from putting data onto their 3G network. So I just open up accounts all over the place, 
my machine just grabs one and away we go. But it's different all the time. So it's very difficult to figure out where I'm coming in from. So let's now look at uh, being a bit devilish. And this goes an awful lot of data. So supposing I got a document and, and I really want to uh, make it secure. The first thing that you can do is get five or ten accounts for free from cloud operators who will give you anywhere between <coughs> three and 50 gigabytes for free. You just sign up. It doesn't cost you a dime. You take your document, and first thing is you do uh, is you encode it. You then pass it up, <coughs> and you put it onto separate servers out there in the network. Now, that's pretty difficult for someone to, one, find it, and two, dumps, do something about it. Now, I only pass that into three chunks. Uh, I could equally well uh, have done a much more complex job. Uh, and right now, these are all shown in green. But supposing I pass the document and then encoded it with 10 different encoding routines, and then I slide it all over the network into lots and lots of different servers, having destroyed it on my machine in the first place. Now, Mr. Bad Boy, find that and get my secret information. That's relatively easy to do and really hard to crack. What is more, I can send these past and encrypted pieces of information over many different paths. And that picture just exemplifies how are you going to find interesting and secret information when it's spread out all over the place. It makes it very, very difficult, if not impossible. So here we are with all these different operating systems and apps. Um, and these are compounded by time and location. Uh, it's always very funny when I'm in the United States because uh, uh, people get amazed at the time that I uh, answer email in the UK. They think I'm actually awake at uh, 3 in the morning, but I'm not. I'm over here, but it looks impressive. <laughs> so where's the biggest risk of all? Well, funnily enough, it's the people. They're always the biggest risk. Uh, I have walked into secure operations and been told that it's super secure, you can't break in. I've put my security badge in my pocket, walked down a corridor, knocked on a door and opened it, and just used a very simple thing. Excuse me, guys, anybody using Wi-Fi in here? Yes, uh, I've got a bit of a problem. Ah, you need the password. It's W-R-I-A, and it's that easy. People are so helpful. So people uh, are always the, the weakest link, and we really have to do something about it. And the logon procedure has got to be made a lot more complex. Personally, I have a lot of trouble with passwords. I, I don't like password management software. Uh, that seems to me to uh, be giving, possibly giving away the keys to the kingdom. And uh, every time I get a new account, I find that they need something unusual like two capitals and three numerals. Everything else is in lower case. And the permutations are such that I can't have one algorithm for all the password generators. So we need to start thinking a little bit uh, wider. Um, there's been quite a furore in the United States and the United Kingdom uh, about one manufacturer of hardware in the network, Huawei. Well, they're not the only one. Uh, every one of you is using a device, several devices, where all the chips were made uh, in China, all the devices were made in China, and uh, none of the software code was written in the US. So do you suppose for one moment that there are not back doors into every single device that you own? I mean, I am always amazed at the, the way that security energy is always focused in the wrong place or spread too thinly. We have to start thinking a little smarter. And the questions to ask is, who wrote the software, built the machine, who made the chips? All the hubs, the servers, the whole network is wide open. If you start from there, then you approach the whole area of security entirely differently. So there are some other big questions to ask. Here's one that's a good one. Is your IT department in the big league? 
Can they cope with the sophistication of the cloud working and the new threat scenarios? Do they have the same ability and resources as Cisco, IBM, Google, SAP, CIA? Do they? Or are they in the little league, <coughs> preoccupied by the next office upgrade, <coughs> land provision, old services and operations? I think that's where most IT departments are, unsure, unaware, uninformed, underpowered, in fact, blissfully ignorant. But we are going to be handed that chalice. The onus for security is going to land squarely with you and I. First of all, we should ask the question, do we actually care? If anybody wants all my email, you can have it. If you can find anything interesting, let me know, because I can't. <laughs> okay, I mean, a lot of the documentation I have, I'll freely give it to you. There are very few things that I would guard, and those few things need to be nailed down. So we can actually do a terrific job of having, for the enemy, confusion by diffusion, by putting our critical data amidst a mass of immaterial data Let's see if, see if they can find the software or the time to go through all of this and find the really important bit. The security threat, to my mind, is no longer some kid messing around on a PC in a bedroom. It really isn't. It's not the loners, the, the amateurs, or, or the hobbyists. It's now big business. It's criminals and it's states. The big threats are now government agencies and criminal organizations with huge budgets. You might find the lone hacker with two, three, five, ten grand to spend. Criminal organizations, you start to look in the tens of millions. But by the time you get to state-sponsored work, you start to talk billions. And it's not by some kind of mistake that everybody's breath was taken by back by Stuxnet and Flame and, and a few more happenings where the level of sophistication was really quite confounding. By the way, you can buy Stuxnet and Flame on the internet for about $5, but I think you get a visit from the CIA about 15 minutes later, I'm not sure, I've not, I've not tried it. But all of this stuff is available. Um, almost none of the big threats are being detected by firewalls uh, and by viral detectors anymore. It's there. We have to live with it. But we can do a lot to help ourselves and help our organizations by being a little bit devious, by exploiting the cloud, because it's got degrees of freedom that we've never enjoyed before. On a global scale, it's kind of interesting. I am stood on the ground in a nation that spreads more malware than any other nation on Earth. And the reason is the United States is used as a broadcasting hub. The dark side of the force comes to the United States to spread its wares, and it makes the country look not so great. If you go to China, the biggest threat is the United States. If you come to the United States, China is the biggest threat, and so on. I suspect uh, neither, none of that is true. I think it's someplace else, and I think that they're being clever at the way they are hiding things. You may or may not know, but uh, if you unpick Stuxnet, uh, there is a very interesting line of code uh, that is in hex, and when you actually uh, put it to, into alphanumeric, um, it gives the address of MI5, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> And it's full of interesting stuff like that, really good. So my, my take is that we've got to get large corporations, and I mean the big players, to get together to form a defense against this stuff. And we're going to use them because we're going, that's where we're going to put our things, our information. And the DIY companies are not going to survive. Some company with 20 guys in IT department stand absolutely no chance. In the UK, I was recently challenged by a guy and the lines were, 
I got a security company. I got the best programmers in the world. I got 30 of them I could take on anybody. And so I asked a simple question. How many PhDs in mathematics have you got in that team? So what do I need mathematical PhDs for? So I just walked away. People don't get it. This is incredibly complex stuff. It's incredibly skilled stuff. This is not just hacking away at code. This is really deep and devious. We have to be equally deep and devious to prosper. This leads me to an interesting topic. What about our personal slime trials as we go around the world? We're in the internet, all our information. How can it be exploited? Um, I think the answer's got to be yes. Some of it I am actually keen for people to exploit. The car company who takes off me my wallet of about 50 cards of uh, air miles, hotel points, coffee shop points and everything else and manages it for me, I'll pay them to do that. There's a business in there. And if they want to give me rewards, I'll give them information. There's stuff I don't want them to have, just like you. The cloud is aptly named. It empowers us to create a fog of complete and utter confusion about ourselves. It's entirely down to you and I. Not somebody else's problem, it's ours. So my advice is this, be prepared. The cloud offers us the most potent defense. We have to think about it. We have to employ it. But I'm really quite excited about the whole thing. But it hinges on having bandwidth in both directions. Right now, I've got one foot in the cloud and one foot out. I have to carry my apps with me. I have to carry a lot of my data with me because I can't guarantee that I will be able to download it. And a lot of my files now are top side of 500 megabytes, and going into a coffee shop with three megabits per second just doesn't cut it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. You will see at the top there my company website. Below there is my personal website. And if you go to either one of these URLs, you can download that presentation and you will find on my personal website about 35 uh, PowerPoint presentations, including one called Super Secure Clouds, which has got about five times the devilment uh, in it that I just exposed. Thank you very much. Peter,